everyone. A uh, special episode this time. Um, I'm going to put my originally planned episode for wait, wait, PSA on the day before this. Um, that has some quick information on Nintendo Power Retrospectives is going on a brief hold uh, while I work on getting caught up on Next Gen Magazine because that is providing necessary. I'm using that for help refresh my memory and get background for when I for Nintendo Power Retrospectives and particularly when I hit the end of each year of Nintendo Power. So, in the meantime, um, we're going to talk about the special event I went to last night, um, the Hollywood Video, the Hollywood Theater in Portland, which is one of several old school movie houses that we have in the area. The Baghdad Theater, which is run by McMinimins, is run, uh, one of them. Um, the Laurelhurst started out that way, but it doesn't quite have the same vibe um, that the Hollywood and uh, the Baghdad does. But um, they have been running a monthly special event where they screen anime on the big screen. And my mic a bit. this month was no exception. Um, we had a, they did an anime film festival. Past couple ones, I hadn't been able to get tickets. They sold out pretty quick. This one, I managed to get on things fast enough to get tickets for this event. Um, and so this little film festival of OVAs. They screening four of them. Well, technically three OVAs and one feature length film. And the OVAs in question being Labyrinth Tales, Make You Monogatari, also known as um, Neo Tokyo, as the US title was released as. Bow the Visitor, an adaptation of the manga by Hirohiko Araki. Dragon's Heaven, a anime OVA created by um, Makoto Kobayashi, a longtime mechanical designer. This is one of his first few works he's directed. He's done some direction, some moderate direction since then, but this is kind of his big, his big high-profile chief director runs the show thing um or his first one where he like ran the show he'll also go on to do stuff like um he did a chief direction for six angels in 2022 and a few other things um but he's still mainly focused on key animation and production mechanical design and Finally, Project Echo. Now, I'm going to get into Project e Echo the least because I'm going to be, because we're going to at some point do this as an episode for Nintendo, for um, the Animal Explorations podcast, because there is, I'll give you a second while I reach off camera, a Project Echo tabletop role-playing game, and it is my intention to cover every anime that is received. In it is my intention on the podcast to cover every tabletop every anime that's received an officially licensed tabletop uh, role-playing game release in the United States with perhaps maybe the exceptions of um, Goblin Slayer and AD Police Files for various reasons that which I'll get into off the air with my co-host to see if they want to see if those are deal breakers for them or not. But in the meantime, Project Echo will be getting a more involved adaptation on, on adaptation involved discussion on the on the podcast in the future. Not this year, but maybe next year. So as far as the others, um, Neo Tokyo had um, those three are works that I had never seen before, uh, but many of them were ones that I intended to see. I intended to see. Uh, Ne um, I heard great things about Neo Tokyo and Dragon's Heaven and Bao I had heard about on an episode of the Anime World Order podcast and its particular style, its particular vibe had cost my, got my interest, particularly also with having seen um, JoJo's Bizarre... I'm, Yes, I mean, recently started our rewatch of Joseph's Bizarre Adventure, the first season, and moving into uh, Stardust Crusaders for subsequent months. Uh, so I will not, for those who are listening to the Anime Explorations podcast, um, we recorded the episode on JoJo's season one, 
before I went to this event, so I did not get a chance to get into it there. I will probably talk about it on the um, first episode for the first half of Star's Crusaders in brief there as well. But in any case, starting off, um, Neo, to um, Neo Tokyo has um, three installment three parts, a framing narrative with um, directed by Rintaro, along with two segments, um, The Running Man, directed by Yoshiaki Kaujiri, and Order to Stop Construction um, by Katsuhiro Otomo. <clears throat> um, of those, the one by Rintaro, which is the frame story, which is titled uh, Labyrinth Labyrinthos, is a very, very vibe-based thing story it is definitely playing into the labyrinth tales part of the title with uh the framing narrative spitting a lot of time like with creating a mystery environment that that ultimately leads into the presentation of the other two stories and then fades sags out it's interesting watching this in contrast with something like Robot Carnival, which has a bit of a framing story with the cataclysmic movement of the Robot Carnival through the wasteland, where the framing narrative has a sense of menace to it, um, not just mystery, but mystery and menace, your threat, which plays into the other two stories, but does not have the sense of cataclysm coming out of it, that cataclysmic catastrophe that the ending of Robot Carnival. The neck for the running man, um, like, this is, like, if you're good, this is, I would say, while this is a 80s anime, I do definitely get the sense of, like, if you were to, when you look at how anime was presented in the 90s, um, this definitely has that strong vibe of meshing with that. I mean, for one thing, it's Kawajiri. A lot of 90s animation and how it was advertised and sold definitely were, fell back on marketing based on imagery of Kawajiri's work often meshed with the music of KMFDM. And in fact, um, especially considering that the running man sequence, I believe did play on MTV during the liquid television, but solely in isolation. Um, we didn't get the, you didn't get the rest of the framing story that way. And it particularly interesting because, This was also released by a so this was released by Streamline originally and then relicensed with uh, uh, with uh, by ADV, whereas like the Kabojiri KMF combined with KMFDM visuals is something that I also associate with like manga video or US manga core slash Central Park Media, that sort of thing. So that bit there. And then finally we have um, Otomo with Orders to Stop Construction and this came out I believe I'm going to double check so this came out actually after like, a little before Akira so Akira would have been actually in production while this was going on and so you'd be like like he, he was working on like this and a robot carnival more or less the same time as he was working on Akira. And I think of, uh, of the, th of his shorts that he did during this period. Um, I think this is stronger. I think that like both in terms of cohesive narrative, um, the implementation of his um, 
way of drawing industrial and um, of developed devastation that you see bits of toward the conclusion of Akira and in the film and the later portions of the Akira manga, it really gets across that sense there. Plus, although with a different twist on the narrative um, or the narrative themes in terms of the theme of quarter stop construction. It's, it's not subtle that its theme is about man losing control of technology uh, of his, of its technology combined with also technology, not being a, uh, able to truly stand up and resist in the sense of the might of nature, which has a whole new sense of res of relevance and resonance now as we see the effects of global warming and the increased strength and weight of various environmental catastrophes from wildfires to hurricanes uh, brought on by um, drought and sea level rise and that sort of thing. So there's that. Um, all those work very well. Uh, I particularly like the, how some of the works of classical music are implemented into here. Uh, Morning Mood from Pierre Gint, in particular, is actually used in a context that fits with way, the way it is used in the story, in, in the actual play, where the uh, direction and setting information, description information for when the, when the music is supposed to come in in the play is um, where Pierre Gint has been abandoned uh, by his comrades and is stuck in a tree, trying to fend himself, fend off some monkeys while uh, with a stick. And in the same way, our protagonist for uh, Order Stop Construction, uh, Sutomu Sugioka, is stuck trying to basically have been abandoned on this um, automated construction site in a fictional South American country that is surrounded by jungle and is attempting to fend off the jungle with various degrees of failure. And he's in order to stop this construction and the robot leader, uh, Foreman is refusing to do so. And it has this complete with the climax, having, um, Sugioka having to basically beat the robot Foreman to death with a pipe. And it gives that, and it definitely meshes with that, with the context of the piece of music in the original work. I admittedly don't know if that's intentional, if um, Otomo was familiar with how the piece was used in the original work. Certainly lots of people aren't, so it's no fault against him if he wasn't. But if he was, props to him. Um, next is Bao. Uh, Bao was the manga that... Um, here we go. Rocky did before he started JoJo's. Um, Bao ran from eighty four to eighty five. Phantom Blood starts in eighty seven to eighty eight, but this adaptation didn't come out until eighty nine. Basically, there's an instance here of the somebody going, "Oh, Fan this, um, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is doing well. It's starting off. It's it's wrapping up um, battle tendency, and it's going to go." And doing well enough, it's certainly going to do another arc after this. What else do we have that Araki has done that we can license and adapt into um, its own work um, to help kind of capitalize on the success? And of those, like, probably the longest running works at this time were either uh, The Gorgeous Irene, um, or Cool Shock BT or Bow, and I'm not familiar with the um, with those other two works, so I'm I'm guessing that they probably went. Well, Bow is thematically closer to JoJo's in a lot of respects in terms of content and violence and that sort of thing, um, and so they went with that. And Bow is, from a writing standpoint, as presented in the animation, kind of eh. Um, Bao more, the, the main character of Bao, uh, Iro 
Ikuro Hashizawa, um, who has been invested uh, invested with a the bow parasite, is like from the, how the powers uh, that he develops over the course of the anime work. It's basically like he it feels like a proto for, prototype for some of the pillar men. Um, like a lot of his powers that he gets are ones that you'll see um, ACDC and WAMU um, use over the course. I think even some of the powers that Santana has over the course of Battle Tendency. Uh, and this works varying, and the narrative has Ikuro and this young girl named uh, Sumire um, trying like trying to get free of this organization and when Sumire is kidnapped goes for um, uh, Ikuro goes to bust into the organization to rescue her and take them down once and for all. It's all right. Um, I think it was fun though. Um, the, with the, the level, like, it's got significant levels of Jojo level, Jojo violence, he, like particularly comparable to what you see of the first two arcs, um, people getting chopped up, um, comedic level over the top levels of blood, uh, a little bit of body horror and that sort of thing. Um, much as with, uh, Joe, uh, much as with, um, Ferris Jojo arc, you can kind of tell what Araki has been watching as he, um, from references made in the anime and presumably in the manga as well. Let me check something real quick. Like we have references to scanners. Um, that we, yeah, we have references to, to scanners. We have references to check the f release date for the film. Um, the Terminator had basically just come out while the manga was running, and as a character who pops up later enough in the work that it feels like the char that the in the manga the character may have been introduced after the Terminator came out in the sense of Araki seeing like having the concept for the character, seeing the Terminator and getting a couple striking visuals from that and going, okay, I'm going to adapt those. Like I can work those vis I can use those visuals with this character kind of thing. Um, even the character is not explicitly equivalent to the titular Terminator. And we're talking the first movie, not Terminator 2. Terminator 2 wasn't out yet. And it's like it, it, it's fun. Um, with a full audience, it's you had really great aud audience reactions with heightened experience of seeing this movie that I think would not have made it as fun if I was watching it in isolation at home. Where, like, whenever Bao busts out a new power, whenever he and get this. Pause, this, this thing's pause. We get a title card on screen ex saying what the name of the power is, and then the action resumes and Bao kills a bunch of uh, bad guys. Um, when all of these moments happened, the audience, like, we had audience like cheered and applauded and that sort of thing because this is just so over the top. Um, and the spectacle is just so fantastic, and everyone dug it. Um, and so, I, again, that was. That was really great watching this with a whole full audience of people. Um, and something where if I was watching this in isolation at home by myself, or even maybe with a small number of people, it wouldn't quite have had the same resonance. Um, it's the kind of thing that makes me go, maybe I like, get why people do horror movies with other people and makes me go, maybe like, and I just like full theaters make me more inclined to go see horror movies with people in the future or like in the theaters. Cause normally I tend to watch them at home, um, to heighten the reaction that way. The third and final of the shorts that I'll talk about at length here is dragon's heaven, which was a 
OVA basically done by design studio Artmic and animation studio Artland more or less to like based on a doujinshi that the that um mechanical designer um like long-time mechanical designer Makoto Kobayashi had written done with Bandai to make model kits that and that kind of colors the tone of this of the work here in terms of narrative um that this is very much a work that feels written to a degree to focus on the model to, to have the model in as many kits uh, the mech in as many scenes like scenes as possible to the point of having it be autonomous and giving it its own personality and able to talk and that sort of thing to give that reason to have it in every scene or almost it or other robots in almost every scene to help promote that side of things considering again this is a 30 minute short but on the other side of things the visual style of the animation is very heavily inspired by Mobius um, and like I'm not just being here in terms of like the grit and grain and texture of the characters and that sort of thing like you see like there is what I, what I would refer to in Mobius when it comes to comics and that sort of thing the Mobius hat if you have seen anything by Mobius if you've seen um, Lincoln, Lincoln if you've seen um, if, uh, if you've seen Arzak, you have seen the Mobius hat, this big kind of conical with a rounded top hat that comes up in a lot of Mobius's work. And <clears throat> it's one thing to have that, that texture that Mobius used in a lot of his work and say, oh, that looks kind of Mobius-esque. But when you stick that hat in there too, it's like, oh no, no, oh, this is, this is Mobius tribute. <clears throat> and uh, with all this, we also get like a, um, like at the beginning, a very short, like radio controlled model sequence with each of the two, like main robot characters of the work um, before we get the animation portion, which almost feels like designed to highlight the model kit to do promote you going to get the model versions of these characters to build at home. That said, um, considering Kobayashi's background as a mechanical designer, this definitely feels like a passion thing that he wanted in there and going from articles on it by like Zimmerit at Zimmerit.moe. Um, I would certainly suspect that like this is more a I want to do this and apparently he uh, paid for the model building the models out of pocket. So that so this, this was another one where it was fun to watch it on the big screen. Um, of the three, I think the audience had the reaction to this felt a little more mixed. Um, like I could hear a few people on like, oh, Dragon's Heaven. Finally, we get like Oh, like, oh, I know this by its reputation and getting to see it, or maybe we've watched it on YouTube and now getting to see it on the big screen. Um, but I, like, and there was a bit of an applause once the credits hit, but I didn't don't necessarily see or got the same vibe from the audience of, like, the energy didn't quite feel the same. Lastly, Project Echo. Again, I'll talk about the plot and so forth at length in a future episode of the Anime Explorations podcast. But for Project Echo, until I can talk about the audience reaction, um, the audience reaction, I'm, I'm going to say mixed, but that's kind of like, the, like it's variable depending on the part of the work. Like, Project Echo has a kind of degree of weirdness between like, heavy slapstick and like serious violence with ripper um 
with repercussions and a death toll and that sort of thing that kind of just ram headlong into each other um, with the climax of the film. And so like the audience was very much like down for the comedy and that sort of thing. Um, but like with the, the end of the film, I didn't just like all of these got a degree of applause. Product Echo didn't feel like it got the same level of applause, but also this was running long. I will say like we started at six o'clock. We didn't actually get out of the theater until 11, um, like six 30. And with the intermission, a few other things, we didn't get out until 11. Uh, we did, um, uh, have an intermission after bow where we picked back up at nine, we had a little bit of technical difficulties with echo that led that be pushed back a bit. But no, um, like, yeah, we didn't get out of the theater until 11 o'clock. So I like, could see a certain degree of the audience kind of flagging with the late night and that sort of thing. But all I enjoyed all of this. I enjoyed seeing all these movies on the big screen. Uh, I do recommend if you have the opportunity, not just for like newer works of anime um, or even like Studio Ghibli stuff to see on the big screen, but also for older things. Um, if you have for as part of your local anime convention or as part of a uh, just general thing at one of your local independent theaters, if they're doing anime screenings, um, please take advantage of those opportunities you can when they sh if they show older stuff to, to see this in the bigger screen and to have that opportunity to watch it, not just both in a larger format, but also in that degree of social format. It really changes the experience. Um, and if any of you watched, were there at the Hollywood theater, please post in the doobly do most in the comments below. I'd be interested to see what your thoughts were on the various films. Um, and if you've had the chance to watch any of these on the big screen as well, um, I do for my research, see that uh, Neo Tokyo did screen on the big screen. In the U S as a double feature with silent Mobius of uh, the first silent Mobius movie, which is about the same length. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts seeing it on the big screen back in the day as well. And well, and if you remember audience, what the audience reactions were like back then. Um, so as far as intended power retrospectives go, I am yeah, putting it on a brief hold. while I get things caught up with next gen magazine, um, should be caught up hopefully by next month, by the tail end of next month, at which point we'll be back on point and for trying to do, um, an issue of Nintendo Power and an issue of Next Gen or so per month so we can get things going there. Catch you next time. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. I also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. 